Um, it's really not that hard to be a good, good pastor with such a good congregation. So thank you very much. You guys are awesome. So good morning. Seems like we kind of have backward Sunday. Everything's a little bit different this morning. So as we get started today, I want to try to share with you. I should have um, some kids along with me today, but so as you, you know, if you go out to the playground or if you go out hanging out with kids, we used to, our, one of our sons used to play football at Century, and he was in the junior varsity. Oh, there are kids down there? Well, t- children, you're excused to go to kids' own worship in the other room if you want to go downstairs. I didn't know there was kids here. <laughs> okay. I hear them now. Yep, now I hear them. All right. <laughs> Pam's got stuff for you. There's one. <laughs> Hi, Zechariah. Hi, Trey. Hi. Well, three out of four. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's okay. And Gary's really good at it, too. You ever been down it and then they'll say, Mom, look at me. See what I'm doing. You ever seen that? Anybody? Yeah. You know, we do that. And um, our son that played football, I could always, he'd always look for me up in the stands when he'd make a tackle. Or if he'd make, you know, do something right, he wanted to make sure that I'm still up there watching him. And so that's what, you know, we like to be seen. We like to be noticed. Kids love to be noticed. And, you know, we call it showing off. I was at somebody's house the other day, and boy, were their kids wild. They just were running around and everything else. She goes, they don't usually act like that. I go, well, they're just showing off. That's okay. I get that. That's what happens. But we do that too. Adults like recognizing. I just was recognized. It's nice to be recognized. It's nice to get a thank you, a pat on the back, and all those things. You know, people, we're just, and the people of Israel were no different. They liked to get recognized. They liked to show off. They were, they were doing those things. And sadly, it had gotten to the point where the Pharisees, and and the religious leaders were doing a lot of things solely to get noticed by people, not necessarily noticed by God. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. You know, Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. This has been going on forever. We tend to lose our focus and start thinking about who we are and what people think of us instead of pointing them to Jesus Christ. So we're going to be looking at Matthew 6 today, verses 1 to 7 and 16 to 18. And I'm actually using the same version that you have in your pews today. And it's on page 787. If you want to follow along, it will be up on the screen as well. So as we look at this, we're going to look at some spiritual disciplines that Jesus is talking about with the people and about what it means to not be a show-off, really, in those things. So let's read those together. 787 is the page number. I don't want to start when people are flipping pages, so if they want to follow along. I'm one of those, too. I always like to have a Bible in my hand when I'm even at another church. That was really cool on vacation. Both the churches we went to, young people were carrying their Bibles in with them. I thought, oh, I got to go back to my car and get my Bible out because, you know, sometimes I have it all up on the screen. Sometimes I don't carry it along. All right, Matthew 6, 1 to 7. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward, will reward you. And when you pray, do not, <coughs> do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Do not, and I'm going to read 8 too. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. Ask him. 
And then 16 to 18, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now, when we look at these verses, they're in three different paragraphs. So there's three separate thoughts going on here, and each covers a spiritual discipline that we are expected to follow as believers, as followers of Christ. The people of Israel were expected to do these three disciplines. It was part of their upbringing, part of their heritage, and it's also expected of Jesus' followers as well. And so that's why Jesus tackles the excesses and the sinful way that these practices are, are happening in his culture. He isn't condemning any of these practices, only the emptiness of them when they're doing them for show. He's condemning how they're doing them and the reason behind why they're doing them. The first thing Jesus speaks about, he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. He says, don't do your stuff so that everybody sees you. You know, you're supposed to be good, right? We're all supposed to do the right thing all the time. We're to be holy as God is holy. That's what we learned at the end of chapter 5. So as we think about that, when we do something good, we're not supposed to go around announcing it. When we give to somebody in need, we're not supposed to wave it and make sure everybody says, hey, look at what we're doing. We are so good. Because then it goes on verse 2. It says, "When, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. Can you imagine if you were the recipient of a gift from a a Pharisee and there's a guy trumpeting around and everybody's looking at you? How would you feel to be that object that somebody's giving to? You're made to look, you're humiliated and embarrassed. And then the person that's doing it is saying, oh, look at me how good I am. I'm giving to that person And that's what Jesus is condemning that. But I also want you to notice, verse 2, it says, when you give to the needy. He didn't say if. He doesn't say you have to think about it. He doesn't say, you know, whenever it feels good, you know. He says, when you give. It is an expected part of a Jesus follower to be somebody that gives. Jesus followers are givers. That is part of being a Jesus follower. You are giving. You're giving to the needy. You're giving to the the church. You're you're taking care of the people around you. That is a part of who we are. Colossians 3.23 says, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Whatever we do, we're to do it for God. Whether it be giving, whether it be doing something nice for somebody, whether it's just picking up the dirty socks, that somebody left behind or cleaning a a child's dirty bottom or whatever it is, we do it all for Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what we do. And when we do that, it takes the focus off of us and it goes to Jesus. And that's what he's talking about in this. When you give, be it your time, your talents, or your treasure, don't want people to look at you. Do it because God asked you to do it. Jesus' followers are generous with their resources, and they help others. That's just part of our DNA as Christians. And then Jesus talked to the crowd some more, and he said, don't make a show out of it. And like I said, can you imagine being the one that, you know, you gave a donation, and they're, holler, you know, they're trumpeting it, and maybe you're a beggar, or maybe you're somebody that just needed some help, and then to be humiliated like that in front of everybody because they got the credit for giving you something? Now, that takes away from the joy of receiving, doesn't it? And that takes it, makes you feel yuck. I mean, it just makes you feel like you never want to ask for help again. And, you know, and I've seen that happen to, to people where they get so to their, the place that they just refuse to ask for help anymore because they have been made that kind of object in that object lesson, maybe. And we have to be careful about our attitudes because our attitude in giving is super important. We never want to give with the attitude that we're somebody's savior. 
Only Jesus is that. We just want to give with an open hand whatever we have. If you've ever taken um, Financial Peace University by Dave Ramsey, there's one section of that. It talks about giving. You know, sometimes it'll be a family member, sometimes it'll be a friend, and maybe they need a loan. Maybe they've had a rough patch. And, and you have the finances, and Dave Ramsey says, well, you have the finances that you can give them, and that's okay. But he says, don't make it a loan. Because he said, if you make it a loan, and it's your friend or a family member, and they can't pay it back, you're going to wreck that relationship. You're going to always be wondering if you're going to get paid back. And you're going to ha- it's going to make some hard, hard issues. So he said, don't give unless you can give without we're expecting it to come back to you. And that has helped, us, help, helped our family a lot because, you know, that's a good, good thing to remember that, you know, if we give, and, you know, if they pay it back, that's a bonus. That's awesome, and we're, you know, we're super blessed. But if we give it and we don't expect to get it back, that's okay. We're still friends. We're still family. We don't have to look at them wrong, or they don't have to feel guilty all the time. And I thought, I I tell that to people when they're asking me if they should sell something or loan something to somebody. I said, only if you can do it without expecting to get it back. Just because, especially if they're, you know, in the family or in the church or, you know, friends, you want to keep the, the relationship is way more important than some money. So we need to keep those things in happen. Sometimes... It's just fun to be blessed in secret or to bless somebody else in secret. Those anonymous gifts are just a fun thing to do. Um, Gary and I have been privileged a number of times, probably because he wears his veteran's cap everywhere, but we get free meals every once in a while from people in restaurants. And you know, that's huge. I mean, we don't half the time don't know who has done it, and we are so blessed to be blessed that way. And it's just a pure joy of knowing that you've helped someone through a rough but just gives you a lot of joy. And there's a video clip <laughs> from Facing the Giants that shows just that same thing. Double sweet pitch left, pro 45 flex. Man, even a 26 powerhouse. Man, he's some good plays. Who's going to run these plays, Grant? We're going to run them. Man, we got all type of potential on this sheet. When? <laughs> We're going to run them, I promise. Yeah, see, you always tell me you're going to run them. See, all my plays, you don't want to run my plays. Hey! Okay. It's all right. Where's my car? Where you park it? Right here. You sure? Because ain't no way it got stolen. Man, you couldn't pay nobody to steal your car. And the boys do something with it. Man, I don't know. Hey, man, there's a note on this truck for you. What does it say? Let's see. It says, Grant Taylor, the impact you made on our school means more to us than you ever know. The Lord has used you to meet a need in our lives, and now we want to meet a need in yours. You'll find the title of this new truck in your name. Please accept it as our way of saying thank you. Uh Uh-uh. Somebody that gave you a truck? Man, this title got your name on it. You got to be kidding me. Grand Taylor, somebody that gave you a new truck. This is my truck. get a moped out of this or something. Oh, Lord, you've given me a truck. Well, (laughs) it's your truck. Drive it. Not a word to anyone. Yes, sir. Oh, 
how much fun that was just to watch him get a truck, right? You know, to be able to give that way and to be blessed that way, isn't that awesome? And that's what we're talking about is to be able to give without your right hand knowing what your left hand is doing. I like how that father turned to the son and said, don't you tell anybody, because that's the secret of joyful giving, is to be able to give without in just being having open hands and letting it go. So the best gifts, I think, are those that we can do in that way. It's just fun and giving and not announcing it. It's between you and God. Verses 5 to 7, Jesus addresses prayer. And again, it isn't a suggestion. He says, and when you pray. He didn't say if. He didn't say you should. It said when. We are expected as Jesus followers to pray. Jesus followers pray. When you pray, you don't do it for show. You don't stand there on the corner and pray up and look at the, you know, and, and holler it out. And so everybody, and that's what they were doing. Imagine being in Jerusalem and, and all these guys showing off and praying. That would be kind of weird anyway. But that's what we're talking about is don't be ashamed. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do public prayer. It does mean our, we are humble in our hearts and our spirits when we come to God and pray. We don't do it for show. We don't want to sound pious or holier than thou. Don't be a hypocrite. Hypocrites pray to be seen. Not necessarily seen by God, but by the people around them. They, they want people to know what they're doing, but they're not really living it out. They're just wanting it to do it for show. You know, there's a few things we can look at. If you want to spot a hypocrite, Somebody that, one of the things they look for is a place. They need a place that is prominent. These guys and the Pharisees played, prayed on street corners, and they stood up in the synagogue, and they tried to be, make, get a lot of attention by where they picked to, to pray. They also had that posture. They prayed very pompously. They would pray standing they didn't go to their knees. They didn't fall prostrate. They weren't humble before God. Now, it convicted me a bit this week because I thought, well, I pray standing up. I mean, I prayed this morning standing up. I pray when I'm walking. I walk the dogs and I pray. But then I have to remember it's the heart that God is looking at. And my attention is on him. It's just that that works the best for me when I'm out there praying and there are times I go to my knees. I spent a lot of nights on my knees when my kids were teenagers. So I had to the bed many, many times. <laughs> and that's, it's our hearts, and it's the attitude. We have to come there. Our prayers must be sincere and solely focused on God and his will. And, and there's the pride. They showed their pride because they loved to pray when it gave them an opportunity to be seen. And then the product was, Jesus said, they have received their reward. They've already received their reward. They've got people to look at them. Jesus said, they're not going to really get an answer much to that prayer, but they're going to, they got seen. That's their only reward. Not something sad when you think about it. That's their only reward is people seeing them. And that's so fleeting. It goes away so fast. They'll have to keep doing that to get that attention. David prayed with a very sincere heart out of Psalm 51. It was after his sin with Bathsheba. And it's, I want to share with you a few verses from Psalm 51. It's 11 and 12. It says, Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. Our hearts need to be broken when we come to him in prayer. Our hearts need to be humble, seeking his will for us, seeking the direction he wants us to go, seeking his will for those that we're praying for in intercession. And sometimes I know when I've prayed, I kind of wonder if how I should pray for somebody because I don't know what's best, but God does. So I leave that with him. 
Or I, I'm, I, sometimes I get kind of worried when I pray for somebody because I know sometimes God uses very hard things to get people's attention. And I think, ah. Oh. And I know I did that with my kids many times when I was wondering how they were living or stuff they were doing. And I would say, Lord, if they're doing something wrong, could you make sure they get caught before it's too late, before they hurt somebody, before they hurt themselves? And, and something that's happened. And it's just, you, but leaving it in God's hands in pure humility, he hears those prayers because he knows our hearts. Now, Jesus prayed alone, and he prayed with his disciples, but he never did it for show. Now, verse 7, Jesus said, our prayers should not be meaningless babbling. You know, I, I grew up in a, in a church discipline where we sang and, and said the same things every week. And, you know, as a teenager especially, I probably started not listening very good to what those things were. I can remember one, be merciful to me, be merciful to me, oh God, I'm a sinner, or something like that. And we said that every single week, and I had no idea what that meant. I just said it because we all said it. But you know, now, I find myself praying the same things a lot, but then I also remind myself, too, that I do mean them. And I have to, I have to check myself occasionally if I'm praying too fast, or if I'm going through a list, and I think, oh my goodness. I need to really listen to myself and, and make sure I'm really talking about that person to God. And you know, that makes a big difference. That's what that means by babbling. It isn't that you can't use the same words. It's that you need to mean what you say when you say it. And God knows our hearts. He knows if you're just going through the motions or if you really, truly are meaning what you say. Then verse 6, it says, when we pray to our Father in heaven, and when we do it in secret, we will be rewarded. He will hear our prayers. I feel his presence in that supernatural way when I give it all over to him. I always think of George Mueller when I think of somebody that prayed wonderful prayers and had wonderful answers. He was a man during the 1700s in England that started a lot of orphanages. And he did it without any money from the state or the government. And he, would, and he refused to ask people for money. So he prayed everyone with money. He prayed, every, prayed that God would always provide enough. And God always did. And there's some wonderful stories. I read that book when I was a brand new Christian, maybe in my early 20s. And I read that. It was one of the books here at South Troy on some bookshelf. But it really always spoke to me because the other part of that was in another part of the book, it said that he prayed his prayer list for people, his intercessory prayers was like 350 people. I thought, wow, that's a lot of people. But it said before any of, but before those 350 people all had passed away, all had died, they had all, every single one of them had become a Christian. Some of them after he died. But because of his persistent prayer, for those people, the Holy Spirit worked in their lives and brought them all to Jesus Christ. And that reminds me often that I can't give up on praying for people and just continually bring them before the, before the Father. Prayer unlocks the door to blessings and guidance. The Bible teaches us that prayer should be persistent, sincere, and done with faith. Luke 19, 11, 9 says, Ask. And the Greek is ask and keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be open. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find it. Keep doing it. It is a verb. It's an action. That's what prayer is all about. You've done it again, Lord. You've done it again. You are good, and you are mighty, and you are merciful. And you keep taking care of me when I don't deserve it. Praise you, Jesus. You are Lord. Give me another one, Lord. 
Guide me to who you want me to help. Raise up more that will call upon your name. Raise up those that love you and seek you and trust you. Raise them up, Lord. Raise them up. Lord, we need a generation of believers who are not ashamed of the gospel. We need an army of believers, Lord, that hate to be lukewarm and will stand on your word above all else. Raise them up, Lord. Raise them up. I pray for unity among those that love you. I pray that you open their eyes so that they can see your truth, Lord. I pray for your hand of protection and guidance. Raise up a generation, Lord, that will take light into this world that will not compromise when under pressure, that will not cower, Lord, when others fall away. Raise them up, Lord, that they will proclaim that there is salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Raise up warriors, Lord, who will fight on their knees, who will worship you with their whole hearts, Lord. Lord, call us to battle that we may proclaim you King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I pray these things with all my heart. Raise them up, Lord, raise them up. Do you love Miss Clara? Doesn't she pray amazing? Awesome. The last paragraph that we're going to read this morning has to do with fasting. As we looked at that, it says, when you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do. They disfigure their faces to show everybody they're fasting. So they're going around saying, poor me, I'm hungry and whining and all of that just because they're skipping a meal or skipping a few. And Jesus said, when you fast, again, like this says, Jesus' followers fast. That is a part of our spiritual disciplines. But he says, when you do, don't tell anybody. Don't show it to everybody. Don't whine and complain. If you're going to do that, go and eat something because you've already, taken, you've already taken away the blessing. Fasting is to help us to draw close to God. It's saying that I am going to let go of that time of eating and pray to you. I'm putting that aside to talk to you. And I'm taking that time to, to really get close to you, God. It's a spiritual discipline that turns our focus on God instead of on ourself and on our desires. And as we look at that, it isn't a substitute for a healthy diet. It isn't because you want to lose some few pounds. There's, there's all these fast things on, you know, that's a lot of people lose weight that way. That if you're doing it for that purpose, you're doing it for the wrong reason. If we're doing it for Christ, you know, and... Don't, you don't have to start with a whole month. I mean, Jesus fasted 40 days. We don't have to do that. But Jesus said that when these guys were doing it, they were announcing it. They were making sure everybody knew, oh, me, oh, my, I skipped a, I, I am fasting today. Ain't I holy? Look at me. And Jesus said they got their reward. They got their attention. That's all they get. But he says, please, you know, concentrate on me. He said, but he said, it only should be obvious to your father. Only God needs to know that you've skipped a meal today. And when you have a family, that sometimes is quite a challenge <laughs> to make a meal and say you're fasting for the day. Or if your friends invite you out for lunch, I mean, you can make a big deal out of it, or you can say, oh, okay, Lord, I'm going to eat. My relationship with these friends are more important today. I'm going to have lunch with them, and I'll fast tomorrow. I mean, we, we can be flexible when we're growing. Dave Mathis, the auditor, uh, editor of Desiring God, gives us some great guidelines for fasting. Because often I've had that question, how do you fast? You know, that's a, that's a spiritual discipline that we don't practice as often as we probably should. One is start small. Don't go from no fasting to attempting a week long. Start with just one meal. Maybe just do one meal a month. Or then maybe move it up to one meal a week. But you should have a plan. 
but you know, continue to, to work it up to maybe a whole day long fast. <coughs> but for those two that have medical conditions, God knows that. So find another way to make that work. You know, a lot of diabetics have to eat at certain hours. They can't just get meals. So then that's something else to be looking at. Secondly, plan what you're going to do instead of eating. It's a spiritual discipline for seeking more of God. So don't just waste that time. Spend that time talking to God. Spend that time thinking about him, reading his word, fasting and praying. Um, And like I said, consider it how it will affect others. Fasting is no license to go unloving. Good fasting mingles your concern with others. So if there is an issue with cooking a meal at home or if you're making people uncomfortable, then, then work through that. You know, find another time. Do it a different day. Be flexible. Don't be, be more concerned about others than you are about yourself. That's the key. Four, try different kinds of fasting. It doesn't always have to be food. It can be um, chocolate. It can be coffee during Lent. That is a typical time for many people to fast for 40 days from something. And there's nothing wrong with that if their focus, again, is on God. Remember a young man that came to one of our movie nights quite a long time ago, a teenager, maybe like seventh or young teenager, and we had soda and we had popcorn. And he said, oh, I'm fasting soda for the next 40 days. I said, that's really, and he did. He, he, didn't take, he took his popcorn and just had a water. But it was kind of cool to know that this young man had taken that seriously in his, at his church, and he was going to fast for Lent. And that's what it's pretty much about, is just taking that time. And he didn't make a big show out of it. He just shared that with me. And I thought, that's pretty cool to see a young person following through like that. Um, Fast from something, I just said that, don't think, um, and then, yeah, fast from something other than food, and then don't think about white elephants. It's one of the things we have about, you know, healing from your hurts, hangups, and habits. Don't think about what you're missing. Think about positive things instead. Don't sit there and think about, oh, I'm so hungry, because gonna, you're going to get worse and be more hungry. Find something else to think about. That's why you need to focus on God and his word. Take that time. We used to do um, like a, was it, 30-hour fast? That was a lot, 30-hour famine a long time ago in, in, in youth group, and so that we would understand how, what it meant to go hungry. And so we would fast from food for 30 hours. And boy, by the end of that time, teenage, especially teenage boys, would just about be starving because that's the only thing they could think about was eating. And I thought we kept trying to keep them active and doing things, but, you know, that's the thing. Christian fasting turns his attention to Jesus and maybe that one concern that you're praying about. Jesus' followers pray, they give, and they fast. And when you do, when you do, you and I do these things, our focus must remain on Christ. It can't be on ourselves. It can't be on what other people are thinking. It can't even be, you know, it has to be on Jesus. Why are we doing this? That's why I called it the hidden kingdom, because it's those things our, le- our right hand is not supposed to know what our left hand is doing. We do it out of our hearts totally and completely and give it to God. These three disciplines will help us to grow and know Jesus more. They'll help you to become men and women of God. They're a part of our spiritual heritage and part of what Jesus Christ calls us to do as followers. When you give, when you pray, when you fast, give it all to Jesus. And as you live this way, you will become that son, that daughter of Jesus that he's asked you to be. You will see lives changed and prayers answered when you pray, when you give, and when you fast. And you'll just see a mighty work of God all around you as we do those things together. Follow Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, you love us so much. And you have given us these things to draw near to you. And you taught, you lived them all out in front of us. You fasted, you prayed, and you gave. And you are our example. 
you provided for people to have food. You healed people. You, went, you prayed with the Father every morning. You, you prayed in front of your people. And Lord, you fasted for 40 days. You showed us all these disciplines. Lord, help us to be your sons and daughters. Help us to continue to grow to be more like you, to serve you, to walk with you, to live for you every single day. Lord, thank you for all you are doing in our lives. Thank you for the amazing and awesome God you are. Thank you for being our example. Thank you for being our God, that we can come to you. And Lord, thank you that we know you hear our prayers and we come together to you today. And Lord, we bring them all to you. And Lord, before I close, there was one prayer I wanted to make sure to pray for. Lord, you know what's all going around, on around us in our country and in the world around us. And Lord, we commit that to you as well. And Lord, we just lift up our hearts as believers like, like Miss Clara said. Lord, raise up your people that we will hear your prayer and that we will repent and come to you and walk and serve you, Father God. Help us to be the church that you have called us to be, Father God. In your name we pray. Amen.